Thank you for coming today. Thank and you for having me. Yeah. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. And you're coming all the way from Germany, right? Yes. Yeah, that's and right. I'd making a tour of, of New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. I tend to set aside up to three months a year to, to come back home and do concerts here. And oh, there. wow. Well, you're quite an interesting person, so I'm really excited about this, this <laughs> talking with you. So, uh, so probably my first question would be, uh, what were your early years growing up in a musical family? Because I know you've got a lot of brothers and sisters and probably very, very strong mother and father. So. Yeah, I, I think it was probably quite a unique upbringing. Uh, I'm the youngest of seven kids um, and grew up in a household that was just full of music. All of them had instruments of their own. There were four violins, uh, one flute, uh, one guitar, several of them playing piano as a second instrument, singing, you know, all everything in the mix except cello, of course. And so here, there I came along. And um, already at, at the age of three, I think I had selected the, the cello to start as my main instrument. And um, yeah, it was all, all musical from that <laughs> point onwards. So that was more in a Celtic and... <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Uh, so it was because of our unique combination of instruments, um, Celtic music seemed to be the most natural genre for us to jump into, to, yeah. to be malleable for uh, uh, for different forms of expression and, and to, to put it all together. And so my mother was, uh, was responsible for all of that and she... Um, well, she was the one that that cultivated all this music into our in into our family to begin with, because she had initially studied piano performance um, as a student at Auckland University, and oh. um, yeah, as along the side as uh, of of becoming a mother, um, ended up influencing that and and making sure that that was a a big part of our family. Wow! So, and you traveled you traveled the world. We did. As a family? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's quite interesting because uh, our all of our family experience on the stage started out with just house concerts. And, you know, it was, we would do occasional weekend concerts where we would play uh, for our grandparents in our living room. And that would, that would be sort of the start of it. And then eventually we started inviting a few more friends over and then... Uh, and then the stage grew and the number of of the audience grew and then suddenly we ended up finding ourselves having uh, pretty big annual family concerts where we ended up um i think the uh the last one that we ended up doing um uh was we ended up having about 2000 people show up at a at a school auditorium wow. yeah. um and that was sort of our our big finale i guess and then in the meantime we were lucky enough to uh, have opportunities to uh, tour throughout the United States. Uh, we went to a couple of Celtic festivals over there and were um, traveling around in, in a couple of big vans and performing here and there, finding finding places to stay. And uh, um, and then another trip, which uh, which we were able to do throughout Germany as well. Yeah. I uh, understand you were um, educated at home. Yes. And as I was with your mother and your father. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was also probably I mean, all, a very all unique. Of you, all of you children? Yeah. Uh, at, at various stages. Uh -huh. So uh, I think the oldest two siblings, they started off at, um, at primary school or intermediate school. I can't remember exactly. Mm -hmm. And then uh, and then they, they started doing homeschool from high school onwards and then the rest of us ended up doing it in reverse wow. um so i was homeschooled until uh year 12 uh and then went into high school for the sake of getting university credits when i needed to and uh yeah and that was that wow what an experience <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was certainly um it certainly made a difference having many siblings around me um doing the homeschooling so it it, it you know, I, I wasn't bored or anything. I had <laughs> friends around me and I had plenty to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so your brothers and sisters are still involved with music? Or, uh, yeah, no? yeah. Um, two in particular have continued performing professionally, uh, both violinists and they, they're the younger two, two sisters. Um, oh, wow. One of them has continued mainly in the, in the Celtic music scene, so she's uh, doing Irish fiddling, uh, here and there, and teaching on the side in Auckland. 
And then the other one uh, is currently living in Dusseldorf in the same city as I. Um, um, she actually just got a job um, in the Vede Air uh, Orchestra in Cologne this morning. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what people have had an influence in your life? Because I know all of us kind of co-op that somebody, a, a parent, a relative, a teacher, or whatever, has really kind of put the, uh, put the spark in us, and we, we go on to do things in life. And I know you must have that. So. Um, I would say probably the list is endless, and, yeah. and m most likely in every single one of our lives, um, uh, we're unaware of, of the impact that, that any person has upon us. Mm -hmm. um, but if I were to narrow it down to, to just a few names, uh, uh, my, my teachers growing up, so the first one who ignited the spark and the, and the passion for the cello was uh, Sally Ann Alloway. I began mm -hmm. lessons with her at the age of three and uh, continued teaching. I continued with lessons for uh, seven years, I think. Oh, I think wow. that's been... Um, quite a, a steady pattern actually with all of my teachers. So then after her, I moved on to James Tennant, who was the perfect fit for um, helping me develop into, into the advanced stages of, of playing the cello. So making, uh, yeah, just boosting me to the next step. And he was just absolutely uh, key to making sure that I would never be satisfied with um, where I had landed, but was always constantly looking for the next step and, and to how to make what I would have at the time thought was adequate to uh, uh, to refine it and to to uh, to add flair to it to always take it to the next step. So he was hugely influential, and also from a professional standpoint as well because. Um, while I did my degree at Waikato University with him, um, the bachelor degree, uh, I was enrolled in a very specialized course for what was called the Solo Stream at the time, which unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. But um, this enabled me to be more focused on the practical side of performing and less involved in the, uh, there was kind of a, a reduction in, in the workload, academically speaking. And so this, um, sort of required me to prepare a 90 minute to 120 minute recital every semester which was you know for four years which is quite a big yes. and unique um, comparison to most other bachelor degrees where uh, in the first year or in the first semester a student would um, ordinarily be uh, required to do a small technical exam maybe a 20 minute 30 minute exam and then at the end of the year uh, would do a, a 60 minute recital so that would be kind of the standard procedure but then this time i uh, i guess had the extra stress of preparing not only more repertoire but also in a, in a shorter amount of time and that allowed me to to just expand my repertoire at a, at a very fast pace so professionally speaking um uh, that was that was a very key key factor in in me moving forward. Of course, there are, there are two other names that I have to mention as well um, for being hugely influential on on my musical career are my current teacher, Peter Whispelway, uh, who I will talk about later, I'm sure, a bit more in detail. Um, and then Wilma Smith, who's, who's a national treasure in yes, New Zealand. Yes. Um, so everybody knows her and she's just been... Uh, well, she spotted me play in the in the the chamber music contest um, when I was a a bit younger, and um, and since then we've been uh, well, just great friends. And she's been uh, supporting me and and finding opportunities for me to to always come back and to collaborate with her, not not only in, in New Zealand, uh, but also in Australia, and uh, yeah, doing doing bits and bobs here and there. So that she's been absolutely wonderful. Oh, great. Um. The other thing that we all have, there's I call them watershed moments in life. Would you like to share some of your watershed moments? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, probably the first one that comes to mind is uh, 
uh, is the competition win at the um, at the the chamber music, the national chamber music competition. Uh, I was thirteen at the time, and I played in a piano trio called uh, Solotinsky Trio, and that was indicative of. Uh, uh, Shostakovich's best friend at the time, and 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 we chose that name because we were playing the, his second piano piano trio, and this work was perhaps the first work that um, cut really deep into my soul. And as a as a young teenager, I think this is the first work that actually uh, created uh, a personal impact. And kind of showed me what sort of a depth classical music can have. Um, and we worked like we looked, worked like crazy for months on end just to make sure that we that we had that up to a really really tight level. And uh, so that was a unbelievably rewarding moment to to win with that as well. I mean, winning was just a cherry on top, but just to to have that experience of working at a piece so. Uh, so much in detail and in depth for a long time and with some very dear colleagues um, which was Delvin Lin and and um, and Ray Ong um, yeah so the win was just the cherry on top I mean we I don't know if we we even entered the competition to win but just to to, um, to have that opportunity uh, yeah, that was probably the the first big watershed moment. And it must have been really uh, quite inspiring to you in the collaboration of working with the with the team. <clears throat> um, and that's the, uh, that was probably the um, experience that that got me to fall in love with chamber music as well, particularly the piano trio. Oh, so that's uh -huh. my favorite constellation of uh, well formation of a, of a chamber group to play. So. Oh wow. And you're, are you going to be, you're doing a, a, a lunchtime concert. Are you going to be doing any of these pieces? And No, unfortunately not. Uh -huh. Today's um, lunchtime concert will be featuring a bunch of the solo repertoire. Uh -huh. And so I thought it would be nice to start out with a Bach suite, or at least half of a, of a Bach suite. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are a couple of pieces which I chose to put in because I... Um, well, it sort of celebrates a, a new release of my CD, uh, which has just come out a couple of weeks ago. And the CD uh, was recorded during the COVID uh, period in 2020, actually, and, and took some time to, to be processed because of uh, a couple of problems, a couple of obstacles along the way. But um, uh, but the album is called Solitary Fables, and um, uh, it, it sort of tells... Uh, tells a short story through each each piece of solitude, which you know, coming from the idea that it's just a it's only solo repertoire, and so there are a couple of pieces uh, that I took out to to put on today's program, which is the Izai uh, cello sonata from Eugene Izai and uh, uh, Ligeti, oh, wow. uh, two two solo sonatas. And then to finish off is, is one of my all-time favorite works, at least for for solo cello, uh, is the Kodai cello oh, sonata, wow. which is just very... Very familiar with that one. Yeah. Um, one big thing I wanted to talk about was uh, you've re -reloc relocated to Germany, and uh, and you received your master's degree from the Robert Schumann Hochschule for Music in uh, Dusseldorf. Uh, and your teacher... As a world-renowned Peter uh, Westbilly, you mentioned earlier, uh, tell us about your experiences there and in Europe. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Um, it's been a wild one and a crazy, crazy <laughs> ride. <laughs> He's a, um, a wild Dutchman. <laughs> he is. Yeah, uh, and um, it was kind of by chance that I uh, that I uh, came into his class because. After I had finished my bachelor degree in New Zealand, I had taken a year off and decided to travel a bit and, and have lessons with various teachers abroad, um, including in, in Europe and also in the States as well. Um, and while I was in Germany, I 
was stopping over in Dusseldorf to to meet a friend uh, who had actually studied with me in in, in New Zealand. Hmm. So I went to stay with him uh, for a couple of weeks in Dusseldorf, and um, I knew I was very much aware of of uh, the rapport that his teacher had, uh, which was Peter Whisperway, mm-hmm. and uh, and so he he just asked me. He said, "Oh, should I should I organize a lesson for you?" And so I, <laughs> you know, without words, just kind of nodded my head and said, "Yes, absolutely. Please, let's set it up." And uh, I think I had just arrived in Germany at that point, so I, um, still had jet lag. I was um, hadn't really touched my cello at that point because I was just hoping to have a couple of days of you know, recovering yeah. from from the tedious travel. Um, and then, lo and behold, I um, I get an email from Peter, and, and he says, okay, uh, please meet me in, in so-and-so, this, this room, at 11 p.m. So, <laughs> goodness, okay. Uh, <laughs> I hope my jet lag is going to allow me to to perform okay and uh and this is again a couple of days after i had arrived so i hadn't really practiced i hadn't really done a lot of preparation so it was all quite a last minute thing and so i went to play for him uh i went to the lesson at 11 p.m we had an hour and it was just wonderful Hmm. at the end of the hour he said come again tomorrow same time i thought is this? I, th- I thought to myself, is this is this a, a kind of a standard European uh, <laughs> way of running things, or just have, having 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 very very late lessons? Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, but I just said, okay, I'm not going to argue with you. Um, yeah. I'll come. And uh, so after the second lesson with him, he said, uh, uh, if you want to come and study here, I've got a spot for you in my class. And uh, and we hit it off. Uh, in a lesson so I didn't have any answer other than absolutely I'm coming here (laughs) Uh, yeah so that made the rest of my trip very easy because I had already made up my mind (laughs) (laughs) it didn't really matter who (laughs) who I was having lessons with beyond then uh, beyond that point so uh, so I auditioned and I stayed and I I did the German course and continued studying and um, yeah that was that was just great and being there in association with other uh other musicians and um, performers and composers and what have you. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I will tell you about a um, a pretty extraordinary coincidence, uh, which was unbeknown to me at the time. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll I'll go back to to early early childhood days and just beginning with the just starting out with the instrument. And so I, I learned through the Suzuki method, um, and in the, with the Suzuki method, there, there's uh, there are big organizations which have a lot of group part um, group lessons, and they do a lot of group events. Um, and there was one particular girl that I had that I had met um, starting starting out, and she was a Brazilian girl, but born in New Zealand, and we had started at the same age and um, at the same level, and. We ended up being very good friends for for a couple of years, and then and you know doing big town hall concerts, sitting next to each other, and and those cello groups, and then uh, eventually she had to move away, and she went to Brazil um, with her family, and I'd never heard of never heard from her again, and I just assumed uh, as years went by that you know, he had, you know probably gave up cello a long time and is doing something else, and then. Uh, um, uh, well, as it so happened, I arrive in Dusseldorf and I start studying. And guess who's in the same class? <laughs> so all those years later, <laughs> oh, is wow. exactly the same, the same, uh, the same girl, Marina Martins, who's uh, today an, an extraordinary cellist. She's mm. just brilliant. Um, yeah, so that was a fine chance. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, another one I like to ask is, uh, what fellow musicians do you admire? And respect and why? Yeah. Um, uh, the first one that comes to mind will have to be Sam Lucas. He's uh, uh, my friend from from Australia, and he he came to study in New Zealand with me. And from the very first day that we met, you know, we were we were like best buds. Um, and uh, and he's the reason why I ended up in Düsseldorf, and he's still there. Um, 
and we've had very similar uh growing up experiences like he was also the youngest of of seven kids and we we both had a border collie dog that was the same age and there were there was kind of an uncanny number of of uh similarities that we had um yeah so um so it's always been very admiring watching him watching him and his career um develop um I was kind of Very nice to hear that from too. you rather than say, oh, Yo-Yo Ma or whatever, you know, you've got... Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, next one I know is uh, close to your heart, and I know you'll probably talk for hours, was uh, your weapon of choice. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. <laughs> um. Yeah, I so I do describe my cello as as a weapon because it's only in in a in a limited sense a battle. I don't say that as um, I I I think it's important to to specify that because I don't believe that it's a that it should be a battle on stage or that it's you know that you have to struggle yeah. with the instrument. But rather, in the contrary, I think it's more. Uh, the more you trust the instrument and the more you kind of trust the work that you put into it and uh, and the uh, atmosphere of the stage that, that sort of gets you through it. But in the sense that you've got a relationship with the instrument uh, and when you're on stage, you are... Uh, You're fighting the spontaneity and you're fighting the the performance realm, which is something that you cannot find outside of the stage. So there's, there's no matter how, how much you practice, how, um, how many hours you spend in the practice room, you cannot imitate the feeling of having, um, having the adrenaline on stage where you know that you've got one chance one chance to, to, to perform, one chance to, to pull it off, and you've got all your all the eyes on you. Um, so the battle, in a sense, is rather the abstraction of reality, and so that you can enter into this musical realm and uh, to to fight that performance atmosphere together with your instrument so not against the instrument if that makes sense i don't know if i'm being clear yeah. with this but it's it, it, yeah there, there is kind of a very very specific and limited sense that i the, that i mean with that with that weapon of choice and and uh, talk about your cello and your bow mm. yeah um i play on a reina bailhas instrument uh um which uh, Rainer Bailhaus is a is a German maker, but has been living in outside of Melbourne for um, for most of his life. And um, I came across his cellos. This is like I have two cellos actually from him, and I decided to purchase um, this one that I'm playing on at the moment uh, a year ago, and I keep it in New Zealand mainly for convenience reasons, so to avoid excess travel. Um, and having to buy a second seat. But I decided to buy a second one from the same maker because, uh, well, I just fell in love with his instruments and I thought um, I could rely on his consistency, I could rely on his skill and his craftsman craftsmanship. Um, and so I, I keep my second instrument in, in Germany. Uh, but I encountered... Uh, this violin maker during my bachelor degree uh, I was on the lookout for for you know a, a full-bodied full instrument that could full-size instrument that could uh, carry me through for several decades you know something that wouldn't just be a temporary instrument but something that I could really uh, really explore and get into um, uh, yeah for, for a very long time and so I came across this instrument, um, not this one, the, the other one that I have in Germany at the time, which I think it was 2016. 
um, I heard that he had an instrument available, so I booked a ticket uh, to Melbourne, and uh, and I went to his workshop, and I stayed with him, and I tried the cello, and I brought it back with me the next day. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, yeah, since then, you know, the cello's just been developing like crazy, and then um, and then I purchased the second one last year, and have been enjoying um, discovering the the slight slight differences in the in the personality uh, differences that uh, that the cello has uh, in comparison to my old one. Now the bow that I that I play on. Um, Actually, I'll talk about the main bow that I that I use, which is actually in Germany. I, I'm I'm not playing on it at the moment, uh, but that one is a is a Klaus Grünke, which is a modern German bow. Um, I think he's established quite a quite a name uh, for himself in Europe. And um, I sort of bought this bow on a limb, on a whim. Sorry, <laughs> um, uh, because. While I was still in New Zealand, the Vienna Piano Trio, which has since then unfortunately disbanded, but they they came to to perform in New Zealand, and I was captivated by the cellists playing. I think it was Matthias Gredler, um, and I spoke with him afterwards. We didn't, um, he didn't, we didn't have any less any lessons or anything, so he, he didn't demonstrate. But we were just speaking, and he was telling me about this bow. I thought, well, uh, for some reason at the time, I had, you know, trusted his playing so much that I figured, okay, I want this bow because <laughs> he said so. Yeah. Um, uh, so we we ended up contacting the, the bow maker and he ended up making one on order and sending it over. And so that was an instance of me buying the bow without having tried it before, <laughs> only going at it by word of mouth. And um, yeah, I love it. Has it made a difference in your uh, in your sound? Or? Um, I don't know. I yeah. I I would say I'm not really so particular about bows. So I'm I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not really that fussy. You know, I think if I'm trying, well, I think each bow, which at least presents enough strength to be able to be able to handle um, a big a big work like a concerto, has. Um, has good potential, and so I, I'm always open-minded to to try and see what what any bow is capable of. But um, but this particular bow has, I I don't know if it's just the fact that my technique has adapted to that bow and, and is just morphed into its um, particular dimensions and and weight balance and and all of that. But uh, yeah, I it can do everything that I need it to do. So I, <laughs> great, yeah, it's great. Right. Um, <clears throat> is there anything else that you'd like to to talk about that we haven't uh, discussed this morning? Oh, I I would just talk a little bit more about Peter Whisple, eh? Yeah. Um, and sort of examples of of uh, how he's been very influential and inspirational to mm -hmm. to me, which is um, <clears throat> well, he's been. Uh, he sort of established himself as a as a Bach Bach expert um, pretty early on. I think at the age of seventeen, he started doing um, these marathon concerts where he would do all six suites in one concert <laughs> in <laughs> Amsterdam um, in his sort of home home city. Um, and not not just the Bach suites, but then also the Beethoven sonatas. And he would just do these these big mammoth hmm. um, programs and and. Uh, Back in the in the time, I think audiences were pleased to hear these things on repeat. So he would he would do these concerts annually. Um, whereas there, I think there were a lot of concert venues which are saying, "Oh no, you know, we we had the Bach Suites just a couple months ago, so we don't, we don't want to have them programmed for another few years." Hmm. But you know, yeah. at the time, you know, everybody it, it became a big thing and a, and a big feature that um, he became particularly famous for these. Um, uh, and of course, decades later, he's still doing them. And I think he did a legendary, um, legendary row of concerts, series of concerts at the Melbourne Recital Centre in 2017 or 18, if I'm, unless I'm mistaken, uh, which I unfortunately wasn't, um, <clears throat> I wasn't able to go to. 
but he did three concerts in three evenings in the first. The first was all six Bach suites. In the second concert, um, the, the next day, all five Beethoven sonatas. Then in the third concert, he did not only the 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 two cello Brahms sonatas, but also arrangements of the clarinet and violin sonatas as well. All of which by memory, yeah. of course. Yes. Um, so that sort of gives you an insight as to his um, his wild nature and, um, and formidable, very formidable, and and you know just able to able to enter his own world in an extraordinary way on the stage, and so I've taken that to heart, and and that's been a big um, <clears throat> boost of ins inspiration to me, at least from a performance perspective. And uh, last year, I well, I I had been um, motivated to to want to achieve such a concert myself for for many years. Um, I'm talking about the, the six Bach suites now, and so I finally made this decision last year to to bite the bullet and actually, you know, organize a couple of concerts myself to program all six Bach suites. Oh. Um, so that was a huge challenge for me, and it was, it was the first time that I had undertaken something quite of that magnitude. I think, in terms of workload, and uh, and so that was. Yeah, that was uh, extraordinary that I was finally able to get a good, decent chunk of time to be able to work with him in in detail on all of those suites for for several months on end before before finally getting to those concerts. Um, maybe, yeah, so that was maybe that in was the future we, he, we we could divide him over. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure he would love that. Yeah, yeah. Well, to both of you. Oh yeah, yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. I think it's probably about our, our time to, to wrap it up, but uh, but I really thank you for sharing your uh, sharing yourself with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you thank for you. having me on. All right. Cheers. Thank you.